Hello and welcome back. My name is Thomas Lundmark and you are watching my tutorial on the features of common law and civil law systems. In this video we'll be talking about the training of lawyers. We'll start with the historical development. In the common law tradition it's useful to go back to the 12th century when continental European lawyers would travel to Italy to study Roman law. Later, they continued their studies of Roman law and domestic law at domestic universities. Lawyers at that, that time on the continent were, for the most part, employed by the state. In fact, the state exercised considerable control over lawyers. The high point was probably in 1781 when Frederick the Great of Prussia made all advocates state employees. This type of training in the service of the state emphasizes right answers. After all, the idea is that we are training judges. The common law tradition has a different historical development. As you'll remember, there was no reception of Roman law in the common law tradition, and English jurist Jurists studied law at the inns of court, private institutions, um, where law was taught by legal practitioners, including judges. In fact, English law was not taught at university until 1753, and even then, very few lawyers attended the classes. The emphasis in this type of training was on training advocates for mostly private clients. Let's look at academic legal studies today. We'll begin with France, where would-be lawyers study for three years at university, and after obtaining the licence, they'll do an additional year called Master One, we call it in English, if they want to go on to practice law. In their studies, they'll learn statute law and the judicial interpretation of statute law, an important point for purposes of today's video is that equity and justice are seldom discussed. Let's move over to Germany, which, like France, is a classic civil law jurisdiction. There would-be lawyers also study for three years at university. They have two years of required courses and then one year of specialization that they can choose. As in France, they learn statute law and the statute law as interpreted by the courts. Here again, equity and justice are seldom discussed. We'll talk about the state examination in Germany a little bit later. Moving over to England, we'll see that they also study for three years at university. Often, studies at universities are called at the law school which is a department of the university. They'll have general classes, just like in France and Germany, and some specialization is possible. There's some difference in what they learn. In England, law students learn statute and case law. Case law is, is seen as a separate source of law. And there are frequent discussions about equity and justice, both as to the application of the law and to the law itself. What you see then is an attitude that one is being trained for private practice and specifically as an advocate. The United States is unique almost in requiring almost all lawyers before attending law school to complete a three or it's usually four year undergraduate degree. Now this undergraduate degree can be in any area the would-be lawyer chooses. At law school, they, the students will learn statute and case law, much as in England, and much as in England there will be frequent discussions about equity and justice, both as to the application of law and the law itself. We're moving now to the next step in the training of lawyers, the vocational and practical legal training, in France, you'll see that they require 12 months of a mixture of compulsory and elective courses 
followed by six months of practical internship. In Germany, students will take a year of private and or university classes to prepare for the state examination. Uniquely to Germany, there's a state examination that's administered by the court system and not by the universities. Upon passing the first state exam, students are admitted into a two-year practical training period. They're employed by the state and are supervised by the courts. At the end of that period, there's a second state examination required before they can practice law. In England, we see a bifurcated profession. That is, some lawyers are trained to be barristers, more courtroom activity, and some are trained to be solicitors, more office lawyers, but also they often go to court. The Bar Professional Training course lasts one year, and the um, Legal Practice course for solicitors lasts one year. For the Bar Professional Training course, after completion, to become an independent barrister, um, one has to have one year of pupillage. To become an independent solicitor, one must complete a two-year training contract. Now in the United States, it might be surprising to learn that there is really no vocational and practical legal training. At least none is required. Almost all law graduates take private classes to prepare for the bar examination in their chosen state. And bar passage rates vary quite dramatically from 40% to over 90% in some jurisdictions. The would-be lawyer will be admitted to practice in only that state in which he or she passes the bar examination. And passing the bar examination in one state and being admitted does not automatically uh, allow one to practice law in another state. Let's look at some comparisons at the academic level. Generally, the length of legal studies at university is the same in these jurisdictions, three to four years. Of course, the United States requires a first degree, but not only the United States, most Canadian law schools are moving in that direction, and some in Australia. A difference can be seen between the civil law and the common law tradition in the fact that in the civil law tradition there's more emphasis on what we call black letter law, whereas in the common law world there's more emphasis on gray areas where the advocate plays a role. In the continental European tradition, we see the Roman idea of codes being exclusive, complete, and enduring. So when case decisions are discussed, they're almost always discussed alongside statutes, the statutes that they are interpreting. In the common law tradition, law is seen more as a work in progress. So the courts are working alongside the legislature in developing the law. In the civil law tradition, there's more emphasis on right answers, the idea of training practitioners for public service, whether it be in an administrative agency or as a judge. In the common law tradition, there's more of an emphasis on training advocates, mostly in a private role. There's also a significant dis difference in the role of equity and justice. We'll discuss this a little bit uh, later. Of course, there's an emphasis on statute law in the civil law tradition and a more emphasis on case law in the common law tradition. Some practical, uh, some comparisons of the vocational and practical um, experience. Uh, perhaps the most glaring is that there is no mandatory vocational and practical training in the United States. There is, however, significant on-the-job training. Many lawyers will go to work for public agencies, like a city attorney's office, to learn the basics. There are courses offered. Often they'll be paid for by law firms. However, it is possible for lawyers to go out on their own with no 
real vocational or practical training. We also see the, a bifurcated profession in most of the common law world. Um, now, sometimes it is required a uh, bifurcation, that is where there are barristers and solicitors, but in other places, such as in Canada and the United States, lawyers will usually gravitate to one or the other, at least in major cities. We saw the state examinations that are administered by the courts in Germany. That seems to be unique to Germany and is no way indicative of the whole civil law tradition. I mentioned before that we were going to talk about the role of equity and justice. I'd like to do that under the idea of legal autonomy. By autonomous, we mean the view that the legal system is closed to outside influence. This view of the law is associated with positivism, specifically with the separation of law and morality. But nowadays, it's much more important in this idea that many lawyers want to separate law from politics. What that leads to, this idea of having a legal system being autonomous and separate from politics, is a view of the law that is described as formalistic. That tends to be a much stronger uh, tradition in the civil law tradition than in the common law tradition. The common law tradition tends to be much more what we would call legal realistic. We also see in the civil law tradition an emphasis on what is described as deduction and deductive reasoning, the idea that law should be autonomous from politics and that, in a sense at least, legal rules can be applied in a dispassionate, objective, sometimes mechanical fashion. This often leads to legalistic justificatory arguments which are, by the way, not unknown in the common law world. Legal formalism tends to obscure the real reasons why judges decide the way they do. I find that topic, especially the last one, to be very interesting. And if you'd like to pursue that topic and the others raised in this video further, I could recommend that you start off reading the lecture um, script training of lawyers, but also consult chapters three and four of my book, Charting the Divide Between Common and Civil Law.